Well, brothers and sisters, grace and peace to you. My name is Steve Brooks. I am uh, one of the pastors here at First Methodist Midland, and I want to welcome you all to our uh, service of worship and celebration on this uh, uh, most excellent uh, Sunday morning. We are here today, uh, whether you're here in this room with us or joining with us uh, online, we are here today gathered in the presence of the risen Christ. And regardless of the circumstances and the circumstances that we are going through these days are many, regardless of those circumstances, it's our hope today that you will allow that truth, that reality to be the thing that bears down most uh, on your heart. That we are here together in God's presence and we're not alone. What a week we've had, right? Our already deep divisions have grown deeper as we are seeking to uh, grapple with the death of George Floyd and the racism in our country. There's so much anger and hurt and confusion and pain. We want to say and we want to do the right thing, but we're often afraid that we will do the wrong thing or that the actions that we do take will be misconstrued by others. I know one thing, I'm proud to be a part of a community where uh, demonstrators and police uh, can end a demonstration by joining in prayer and many hugs. So how do we move forward? I'm not sure. But this I do know. We need to regularly issue God a full-on Psalm 139 invitation to search our hearts. Before we respond or react to anything, God, search my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That I believe as we approach God and approach these days with that sort of attitude, man, a lot of great things can happen through the people who follow Jesus. Amen? So it is great to be together. Let's pray. Let's stand. Pray together as we go to the Lord in worship. God, we give you thanks for the beauty of the day and how this day meets the struggles of the week that have passed us. We pray for your grace and that your grace will be sufficient to lead us to a good place. We invite you today to test us and to know our anxious thoughts and give us the courage to say, I'm afraid. And to point out, Lord, those offensive ways that may be in us, may we name them and may we let them go into your presence today. So God, we offer ourselves to you in worship in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. let's sing.
This was great. So normally this would be the time that we invite the children to come up, but we're still practicing our social distancing thing, and I'm kind of getting tired of that word. I don't know about y'all. But what am I question for you kids this morning is, has you, have you ever had to do something that you didn't think you had the skills to do or the smarts to do or whatever? Well, Ty is going to teach us a little bit about that today. And also, did you know that it rained in some parts of Midland this weekend? Let's watch. Hello? Yeah, okay. What do y'all mean I have to do the children's sermon by myself this week? I can't do that. I'm like the youngest person on staff by like a million years. What is this? I, are you sure? I don't... I don't know that I'm qualified for that. Like, like, I don't, maybe, like, are you sure I can do it? Like, I don't think I can do it. Okay, yes, I get that. Okay, all right, I, I'll do it. Okay, bye. God, pardon me, God. If I'm gonna do the children's sermon this week, uh, I really need a sign, because I don't think that I can do it. I don't know that I'm worthy of doing this. I don't know that I'm able to do it. Uh, but just make it rain, God. Uh, if, if I'm supposed to do the children's sermon, just make it rain. Pardon me, God, but I asked, like, if you're really sure uh, for you to make it rain, and like, like there was some water there, but like that, that wasn't rain. Um, God, God, just please, if you trust me to do this, if you really want me to do this, I don't think I'm qualified, but if you really want me to do this, God, just really make it rain, please, make it rain. Pardon me, God, one last time, I promise. Just, I still don't know if I'm qualified. Like, it, it kind of rained, but it was really, really quick. Like, it ended really soon, and like, I don't know if that was like a splash of a car or something. I just, I really need a sign, God. Like, for real, just make it rain if I'm supposed to do this children's sermon, Lord. Just, just please make it rain, God, please. <laughs> Pardon me, God. I get it. I get it. I'll do it. Hey guys, as y'all can see, I am dried off now and uh, just want to let you know how much fun I had with that uh, and that it really was a great time, but that the message that we're conveying with those videos uh, and with, with the sermon, with what we're going to say today, is that God is calling us to things and that we have to participate in them. Uh, that even if we don't feel qualified, even if it doesn't seem uh, super fun or super engaging, uh, that God wants to meet us there uh, and that we have a part to play as we live in this relationship with him. So I hope you have a great week and we'll see you soon. Bye. You know, when you are the youngest on staff, you get to do things like this and get drenched with water. Thanks, Ty, for giving us our children's message this week. I have just a few more announcements for you this morning. You might have noticed out in the atrium, or you might have received in the mail this week your flyer for the Amos Food Drive. We have, um, normally we do this twice a year, and with all that has been going on, it's kind of been pushed back a little bit, but the shelves are empty at Amos, and so we need to help restock them. So if you will take a flyer today, normally we also have the paper bags that we use to fill them, and this time we're not going to do that. We're just going to have you take a flyer that will note the items that we need at Amos, and so that you can go out and buy them and purchase them, and <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, bring them to the atrium, and we'll put them in the boxes. One other thing to note this time that we're doing with Amos is that um, each week, they're in such dire need right now. And each week we're going to just take those on to Amos because they need them now. So if you could continue to buy through um, June 21st, that will be our last call for Amos Food Drive. If you could do that, that would be very helpful. We know and love you and are so thankful at how always generous you are. So I know you will be generous with this as well. Next, I'd like to talk to you about Wednesday Night Live. We've been having it here in this room as well as online, so we'll be continue to have that each week. But this week, we're adding a little element to it. After the Bible study, there will be an opportunity to um, have desserts 
We'll do that in a modified way than normal. So if you want to come and be in the room with Pastor Steve and Pastor Kurt as they continue to teach on the book of Acts, then you can also enjoy some dessert with them as well. So we hope that you uh, continue to make your way out to do those things. Last, I'd like to talk to you about this fun little birdhouse I have in my hands. We have many of our people who live out at Manor Park. We also have a couple of our people who work out at Manor Park. And one of those employees came to me a couple of weeks ago and she said, Melissa, our friends that still cannot get out are really feeling a little bit lonely. What can we do? She knows that they're all on the ground floor, so she went and counted all the windows on the ground floor and we decided that um, birdhouses, yard spinners, those kinds of things might be, bring some cheer to our friends at Manor Park. So what we have out in the atrium are birdhouses that we're going to paint together. So take one, decorate it, paint it. We've got some that we're gonna have next week that haven't quite come in yet that you can assemble. So you can assemble and paint it if you want the extra challenge. Or we have just some yard spinners that you can put together. And on uh, June 20th, we're gonna meet out at Manor Park at 10 a.m. And then we're gonna go around outside and put those around the windows and give our friends at Manor Park a little extra cheer. They're the ones who still are um, being asked to stay in a little bit longer. And so we want to let them know that we see them and we love them. So join us in this project. It'll be a fun one for you and your family as well. Now let's just take a moment to go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, you pursue us from birth, looking after us and watching over us, guiding and teaching us, you delight in us as we grow. You cheer for us as we learn to think and do things with our own strength and abilities. As we grow, you challenge us in new ways, inviting us to stretch muscles we never knew we had. All of these things and continued effort to become the person that you created us to be, the person you see us as. Help us, Lord, to see ourselves that way and with your confidence, affection, with your love and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for guiding us in the cycle of life. You urge us to be strong, to be kind, to be sure and just. You urge us to face the unknown courageously and without doubt, especially in these times now, Lord, with, certain, with uncertainty and fear, in times of sorrow and grief but as well in times of joy. Father, through your word, you remind us to be brave, to have faith, faith of our knowledge of you and your wisdom, the example of love that you support us through in our days in this world. Today, Father, we are thankful for what you've done for us. And let us also be thankful for the men and women that guide us in our lives and lead us to you. And with that, we offer you the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the morning when the world was begun And I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth At Bethlehem I had my birth Danced in wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he I danced for the scribe and the Pharisee, but they would not dance and they wouldn't follow me. I danced for the fishermen, for James and John, they came with me and the dance went on. Dance then wherever you may be, 
Well, for me, it was um, the fall of 1985 that I uh, began my freshman year in high school. Steve Pitts, do you remember when you started your freshman year in high school? Just yesterday, right? Well, you know, whenever you go into high school, at least in Tulia, Texas, um, one of the realities is you start going to school dances. Anybody else have that experience? I had no experience with school dances in junior high. I guess they didn't trust us in junior high to have dances. But So we started these uh, school dances in, uh, whenever I was a freshman in 1985. And uh, I go into these dances with absolutely no experience. Why, Mom, did you not teach me how to dance? Uh, and so, uh, so you just have to learn by observation, you know, this very wooden two-step then you get a little bit better. Then you learn the Cotton Eye Joe. Becca, did you do the Cotton Eye Joe? Uh, and so you start doing these things, and um, you be the, then you learn the jitterbug. And just all these, that's what we did in Tulia, Texas. You know, we had at least once a month, and uh, they're so awkward. And, you know, you put yourself out there, and you want to ask somebody to dance, and you just know they're going to say, what, Kurt? Yes. Well, I did not have as much confidence as you, Kurt. So, uh, so anyway, um, I remember one time at one, one dance, I was uh, dancing with this girl. Her name was Penny, and Penny was cute. And uh, we were just going along. It was a really fast dance. And all of a sudden, she just pulls away from me, and she starts limping off the dance floor. And I'm like, what happened? I, I would have felt it if I had stepped on her foot, right? Uh, but she never would tell me why she left. What does that do for your confidence, Pastor Kurt? Limping? Yeah, left, her limping? left her limping, <laughs> right? It's like horrible. But the greatest memory that I have of my uh, high school dancing days uh, was when I was a freshman that same year, so still just a rookie. Uh, it was that year that my sister, Sherry, was a senior, and we were uh, dancing together, and it was a really fast dance, and we're going along and having fun, and then all of a sudden she just goes flying, boom across the dance floor. 
she was totally humiliated, of course. And everybody was laughing, and I'm like, I'm scared of my sister, y'all. Uh, she's a scary person. She's great, but she's scary. And so, and she's my ride, right? I'm like, how is this going to work? Me going home after I've just thrown her across the dance floor is very, very embarrassing. Well, I lived, right, to see the next day, and uh, it was all forgotten about. Until you know whenever you uh, get to the end of, of various things and different groups of people will you things uh, when you're in high school. And so my sister was willed. You know, this is like in print. She was willed a wheelchair for all the times her brother threw her across the dance floor. And I'm like, hey, I did it one time. Can't you just let it go? See how they blown up? But certainly on that night... Steve Brooks was no dance hero. <laughs> well, we're really just confessing our dance mishaps this morning. That's, that's what our sermon is about. Actually, we're trying to follow a metaphor of how we live with God. The partnership that we join with God as we live life. It is sometimes when we read scripture described as just something simple. God commands, God performs a miracle, and then the people just follow it. And it never seems to work quite like that in our life. There's more of a give and take, though, that Scripture actually describes. God calls to us, tends to extend grace and mercy to us, sort of like inviting us to dance. And then he expects us to get up and dance with him, to make choices that follow along with his will. Now, these are difficult subjects, difficult concepts, even when the world is at peace, even when the world makes sense. But in a real way, our world seems upside down right now, doesn't it? I mean, we closed our church for two days this last week out of fear or warning from the civil authorities here in Midland about what could happen with some of the demonstrations downtown. Never seen that in 22 years of ministry. And yet what I want to sort of lay out for us today is that in a strange way, the crazier things get, the more like biblical times they actually are. That it is such a place when things are quite reversed that God understands we will listen. So we want to take you to the story of Gideon out of the book of Judges. And if ever there's a book that we need to read for today's world, it's Judges, when things all sort of seem to come loose. So we're going to start in chapter 6. I'm going to begin to lay a little flavor for us in verse 3. Israel, the nation, is in trouble. And this is where we begin. Chapter 6 of Judges, verse 3. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying the crops as far away as Gaza, which is along the coast. They left Israel with nothing to eat, taking all of the sheep, oxen, and donkeys. These enemy hordes, coming with their cattle and tents as thick as locusts, and prepare yourself for this, arrived on droves of camels too numerous to attack, or too numerous to count. So picture it, hordes of camel riders coming and destroying all of your harvest for the year. Now this is really pathetic. To start off with, these are Midianites, and there's a particular history to that. If you remember, the nation of Israel descends from the second son of Abraham. Abraham had a son, Ishmael, with a servant, Hagar, and then he had a son, Isaac, through Sarah, and that becomes a nation of Israel. But when Sarah died, the Bible tells us that Abraham got remarried, probably to Hagar, but that's a different sermon. And he had several children with his second wife. The oldest of these new children, the second marriage, was Midian. So these people are actually cousins, quite literally, of Israel. This is a kind of family feud. 
Now, the tribe of Midian was much smaller than Israel, and they had kept the traditions of Abraham. They were nomads. They were wanderers. We have that being described here. They live in tents. They ride camels. Numerically, they are much inferior to Israel. Now, Israel has changed. They went into Egypt. In a sense, they were civilized. They became city dwellers, farmers. And when they moved back to Israel, they settled in cities. They dry land farmed along the coasts in Israel. Numerically, and we'll see this later when the battle comes, they far outnumber the Midianites. This is what I mean that the world has been turned upside down. That the worst elements of society have sort of risen to the top. The Midianites have said it's easier to take from other people than to go out and earn it for ourselves. It's easier to steal and loot than in order to build something. And so Israel, they should have had the power quickly to be able to defeat their relatives, were unwilling to fight. They just wanted it to stop. They just wanted the peace to return. And so they would allow others to come and take what they had spent a year growing or uh, pasturing and just move on to the next year. It is a broken, it is a hard time. And so to finish up our verse, and they stayed till the land was stripped bare. Does that sound like your relatives? <laughs> they come and they stay until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. And so God prepares now to send a deliverer. The only problem is this deliverer doesn't know that he's the deliverer. This is Gideon, picking up in verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the oak tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abizah. Gideon, son of Joash, had been threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Now it's important we get how embarrassing this really is. <laughs> he has gathered together his grain, taken it inside a wine press, which is basically just a big pit carved into the ground, uh, but it possibly could have a cover, but it's definitely deep in the ground. And so the way that you thresh your wheat is to take a fork, a, a winnowing well, and throw it up in the air so that the wind will pick up the shaft and blow it, and then what falls is just your grain. What happens if you do this in an enclosed space, certainly a, a space dug into the ground? You create allergies. That's all <laughs> that you're doing right now. You're just making a big mess. This is humiliating. Having to hide what you've worked for so that others don't come and steal it is not the natural order of things. Let me put it to you in a more practical way. An angel of the Lord actually comes to appear to you and he does so in the morning in the bathroom when you're getting ready for work. That's that kind of scenario. You've got the towel around your waist and, oh, here I am, angel. Can't you give me 15 minutes, God, so I can get my act together? Gideon is caught in this uh, moment. He does not feel like what the angel will describe him as. Verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Right. <laughs> I just got out of bed. My hair's standing up. I haven't brushed my teeth. I'm trying to get in the shower and God is with me. Yeah, okay. Verse 13. Sir, and, and Gideon is kind of hedging his bets here. He says something more like Lord, but that's sort of acknowledging a social superior. He's not really recognizing it's God at this moment. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Is that a question you can get your teeth into? If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. 
And you need to hear that with all the scorn that I think Gideon gave it with. The Midianites. Ever felt that way? Would you have the chutzpah as an angel appeared to you in your bathroom and called you a mighty hero to say, uh, where's God? Why is all this happening to us? Why do the Midianites take everything that we own? Why is our entire nation torn apart by our relatives? If God is really with us, why isn't it like biblical times? I mean, you catch the irony here that Gideon is doing the same thing that we do? Looking back earlier in the Bible and saying, back then, with Moses, it was easy. God performed a miracle and people listened. (laughs) What we really want you to grab onto today is it never really happened that way. Right. One of the greatest enemies to our spiritual development is our imagination. We simplify stories in the Bible so that they can fit in our little devotionals, they can fit in an email, and we pull them out of context to the point in which they're fairy tales. And then we get mad at God because life doesn't match our fairy tale. When you get into the details, God speaks to people when they're in the midst of a world turned upside down. Gideon cannot see what God sees within him. And what we're going to discover, and I think is the greatest part of the story, is that there's this constant give and take between God. This is really the origin of the idea of a dance, that God invites Gideon to be a mighty hero. And then God allows, in a sense, Gideon to express his deepest, darkest doubts. Mm -hmm. I don't see God. I don't see the miracles. If God is really with us, then where is he? God will answer Gideon. And then God wants a little faith from Gideon. And we'll see this pattern repeated over and over. It really is like a dance. Steve and I will cover a lot of the story today, but we can't get to all of it. And I really advise, as you have a little time, read chapters 6, 7, and 8. It gives you this amazing story of Gideon's entire life as he learns to dance with God. But let's let's go back to the text that we're looking at here. Verse 14, God's response to Midian's doubt. And this is worth underlining, memorizing, holding on to. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. Excuse me. Go with the strength that you have. A lot of times we think we're helpless victims. There's so much going on beyond our control. We're powerless. God is not with us. There's nothing we can do. And God says, I don't expect you to fix the world. What I do expect you to do is take what you have and act. Yeah. Do what you can. One of the amazing things that the story does very subtly is throughout all of this, Gideon, who supposedly has no food, is facing starvation, sort of reveals to God in little ways that he's got plenty of things. He was threshing his wheat. He had some to eat. Right after God gives him this great encounter, he tells God, hold on a minute. Now, can you imagine this kind of faith? God gives you a call on the phone and you say, just a minute, I'm going to put you on hold. Who does that? You don't put the God of the entire universe on hold and say, just a minute. But that's exactly what Gideon does. I'm going to go make you breakfast. Okay, so Gideon runs out and he cooks, you know, goat over the the spit. He makes some soup. Make soup for God? (laughs) And then he makes a little bread. And what he's trying to do is what you would try to do with other gods is you would give them an offering. Mm. So if you give God something, he's got to owe you, right? Mm. So God's like, fine, I'll hang out here. It's good. Uh, I'll hang on. And so Gideon goes and discovers that he's got quite a bit of food. He's got enough to put on a little bit of a feast. And then instead of Gideon getting a leg up on God, God says, now, I want a little dance move from you. I want a little test of faith. There is an altar that your father built to the god Baal. And the context of this is that 
bald demands in extreme circumstances the sacrifice of babies. And so that's what, alt, that's what this altar was used for. And God says, I want that thing torn down right now. And this takes a little bit of faith from Gideon, but he sneaks out in the middle of the night and he does it. And it was God taking his doubt and then asking for a step from Gideon. Now the story goes on. God says, Gideon, I want you to organize the nation of Israel. You have the strength, you're a mighty hero, to deliver the people. Gideon says, nope, not going to happen. Sneaking out at night and tearing on an altar is one thing. Going to war with Midian when our nation is turned upside down, no way. And God continues. So Gideon comes up with this test, another test. And this is the part of the story you're probably familiar with. This is the test of the wool. This begins in verse 36. Then Gideon said to God, if you are truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me this way. And if you're counting, this is the second time Gideon has used this phrase. If you are truly going to use me. This is the exact wording that the serpent used in the Garden of Eden. If God is truly for you. It's no accident that despite the dance here, Gideon is, in a sense, tempting himself. He is motivating himself not to act. So he comes up with the idea, I will put some wool, wool on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel, as you promised. Now, we probably know this. Wool, and wait a minute. Gideon has wool. Wool is incredibly valuable, especially amongst the Midianites. So again, he has strength and resources that he doesn't appreciate. But he takes this wool, and wool is naturally resistant to moisture. So a lot of the sweaters that we buy today have polyester and other stuff, but when your mom bought you that really nice wool sweater, go home and stick it in the bathtub. It'll totally ruin it, but you should be able to see that the wool is not quickly absorbing the water. It's resistant to it. So Gideon is trying to create something that he'll know, he'll know that God is behind this. Now we remember, of course, the trade winds, the moisture from the Mediterranean moves into Israel. This is their source of water, when it rains or when there's a heavy dew. So Gideon sets his own little plan out for God. It happens. And you would think, certainly we would think, that when all this happened, Gideon would instantly believe in God. Right? If you asked God for a miracle and he granted it to you, you would have faith. Right? It never works that way. There's always those moments when you're like, can we do two out of three, God? Like Farkelin? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Gideon comes back and says, let's reverse it this time, just to be sure, right? So this time, let the moisture fall on the wool. Now, the wool is supposed to be resistant. And so God not only performs the miracle a second time in order that Gideon would believe, but he drenches the wool, so much so that Gideon can squeeze it and water runs out of it, something really unheard of. God answered his doubt in a great way, but then God would ask, an even greater task of faith from Gideon. And so God passes the Gideon test, right? And uh, Gideon uh, begins to rally the men. Uh, maybe he sees it and says, well, maybe I am a mighty hero, this mighty hero that God says uh, that I am. And so he goes to sleep and he wakes up and you know what's there with him? 32,000 men. Are you ready to dance yet? If you got 32,000 men, are you ready to dance? Right? So Gideon must have been excited. And then God stops him. It's too many. What general ever says that, Kurt? They got too many men, right? 
God says too many. Verse 2 of chapter 7. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. This is one of the things that starts to happen with us when we start to realize that we have some gifts and some strengths and some abilities. We start looking at those things and think, I can succeed in life because of this and this and this. And just notice where your eyes go and your hearts go when you start focusing in on your strengths. I. Everybody say I. I I can do it. And so so God's like, no, no, no. We're dancing. Getting you ready to dance. Let's really dance. It's too many men. And... uh, He basically says, this is how I want you to cut them down. Just tell everyone who's afraid they can go home. Of the 32,000 men, 22,000, a bunch of chickens, right? 32,000, 20, excuse me, 22,000 men said, I'm done. I'm going home. Well, I I still got 10,000. Gideon must have said, let's dance. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. That's still too many. So take them down to the river, and I want you to watch them. And every person uh, of your army who drinks like a dog. It's an odd thing, right, Kurt? Drinking like a dog. It's a reference to the Midianites. Yeah, right. That they're they're calling them dogs. Yeah. And so uh, there was 300 of them that lapped like a dog in the river. And God said, that's the ones I want. 300, let's go. Let's dance, right? And uh, as the uh, story plays itself out, you know where Gideon found himself again? He was afraid. But God's still with him. And God says to him in chapter uh, chapter 7, verse 10, If you are afraid... God knowing full well he's afraid. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pua, Pura, and listen to what they are saying. Go sneak on down into the camp and just eavesdrop on what they're saying. And the things that you are going to hear are going to inspire you to greatness. And this is what happened. He heard this guy interpreting a dream that he had heard, and certainly Gideon is going to win the day. And it just inspired him. And so he led these 300 men, and they took care of the Midianites. In our life with God, when we primarily focus in on ourselves and on our strengths, we are eventually going to see our limitations. And guess what, brothers and sisters? We are limited. You don't hear that very often, do you? Most of the time you hear people say, yeah, you can do anything that you set your mind to. You can do. No, no, no. Brothers and sisters, we in our own strength, we are limited. But when we recognize and respond, everybody say it, recognize and respond. When we recognize and respond, it's always both to the presence and power of God. The mightiness of the unlimited God is released in our lives. And the capacity that our limitations have greatly decreases. Are you familiar with the Mark 9 guy? You need to get to know, if you don't know, the Mark 9 guy. He's one of my favorite guys in all the Bible. If you go to the New Testament to Mark chapter 9, if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn there. Um, He is a guy who is desperate. He has a a son uh, who is in a bad sort of way. He is uh, possessed by an evil spirit, and, and, and Jesus, uh, the, the, the dad brings the son to Jesus, and the dad is desperately wanting to dance. And as Jesus is watching this play out, he asks the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or the water to kill him. Listen to the man's heart. 
But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And that's a prayer. Come on. That is a prayer. And that is this this desire on the part of this dad to really want to get close to Jesus because he knows that that is his only hope. Jesus' response. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Just like without uh, taking a breath, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. This is the dance. That we bring what we have to God. And the, the, the boy's father had this faith that God, that Jesus could do something. But he also named that he had doubt. Do you know you can name both of those things in the same prayer? That you can name your great faith in God and at the same time you can name the reality that you have doubts. That's a prayer. I have faith. I have doubts. And in light of both of these, God, I want you to help. You know, as we try to forge our way forward in life and especially in days as difficult as the days that we find ourselves in, and we may get it wrong, Pastor Kurt. We may, tr- we may say to God, God, give me guidance, give me directions. I want to dance. And we may step all over God's feet. But you know, just the sheer desire on our part to desire to dance and to get it right makes God smile. I have done the work of faith, the Mark 9 guy says. I struggle. Please, God, help. So you can't do it sitting on the sideline. You can't understand the dance, the give and take, if you never get up and try. There was an overwhelming need in Gideon's day for someone to stand up and try to put the world back in order. In a sense, God showed at the end of the day it wasn't so overwhelming. Certainly, It took God's power, but Gideon was able to fix his country with 300 men. And did you get the reference, 300 men that that drink like a dog? It's 300 men that are real men that are going to go outside and, and get it done. They're not the light city folk. If 300 of us would go after a little red meat... If 300 of us would stand up and say, God, I don't know where this is going, but count on me. I will will go. If 300 of us would stand up and say, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Yeah. I think we could fix our country. I really, really believe that. I've said it on other occasions, but I do believe it, that our congregation, our family here is something special. I truly come to be amazed at what our church can do together. When First Methodist decides they want something done, it gets done. I think God loves and respects that. From what we can do with him, it is amazing. Melissa mentioned Amos a little earlier in the service. Amos is a food bank that the church sponsors, and it feeds basically anybody in Midland who needs food. It fills their pantry for a month. It is a tremendous undertaking. A lot of churches signed on the dotted line in the beginning, but sort of like Gideon's story, along the way they were asked, if you want to go home, you can, and so they did. And so the financial material support for Amos now rests on our church. We do it. We feed everybody in Midland that comes and asks for help. Our church, this is what I mean in that we are an extraordinary place. The love, the strength, the compassion, the belonging that I've seen extended at times of funerals, times of needs, when kids are struggling or kids are celebrating. I truly do love this congregation, and I believe that we can make a difference 
if we allow ourselves to be challenged just a little bit. So much is so crazy. And it's easy just to say, I'm sick of Facebook, I'm sick of the news, which I am, sick of both of those things, and just to wash our hands and walk away. Where I think in this, God is truly saying to us, will you dance with me? Will you let me show the world that evil is not in control? Will you let me show that the worst elements like the Midianites in our story shouldn't rise to the top and control everything that's said? But those that work hard, that build, those that love Christ, those that can overcome problems are those that should lead in our world. God is calling the 300 now. We've got to respond. Repeat after me. I am a mighty hero. I am a mighty hero. Wow. Do you really believe it? Come on. This is who God says that we are as we link our lives to the heart of God. It is clear, brothers and sisters, that there are ways in which places in our lives where we doubt. Um, The hardest work that we do is the work of the soul and really taking the time to get in touch with what we're afraid of and the ways in which we doubt God. That's your job for the week is to give yourself some space and to have some courage to acknowledge your doubt and then to invite God. God, I believe. I believe who you say you are. I believe that you are calling me to be a mighty hero, but I got these real concerns. I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And as we earnestly put that prayer into practice, you see, belief is listening. Belief is trusting. And belief, finally, before it's really belief, is acting, putting it into practice. Brothers and sisters, to pray that prayer and allow that prayer to lead us to action. Brothers and sisters, as Pastor Curtis said, our world will be a different place. What say you, mighty warrior? So this morning we're going to take communion together and I'm going to give you just a second if you're at home to get your communion elements together and if you are here in the room with us you should have received a little individual communion cup and we'll go over those instructions in just a few minutes. But let me ask you this question. Do you think you are brave? I think you are. I see it in you when you are um, homeschooling your kids. Thinking about that for me, if I were in the situation that some of you parents and teachers have been in these last three months, (laughs) I, I have said more than once that I'm thankful my kids are already out of school. That was really brave of you. I watch some of you who have gone through cancer, donated organs, I've watched you grieve the death of a loved one. I've watched you give away your sons and daughters in marriage. And I see you with the same eyes that God sees you. And that is one thing that I'm so thankful to have, is to watch you through the eyes of God. But if I'm honest, when I look in the mirror and ask myself if I'm brave, The Lord is with me. I'm a mighty warrior. I don't believe it. It's really hard to believe it in myself. When we say the words, love your neighbor as yourself, sometimes we aren't loving ourselves the way that God sees us and loves us. Why is that? Why do we do that to ourselves? And we doubt and we ask, 
God, show me, give me a sign that I'm supposed to be this person you're calling me to be. Help me to know that you love me the way you see me. And we might feel it for a minute. And then once again, we're asked the same question when God says, come and dance. And that's what he's doing with us. And all he's asking us to do is take one step. You know, and Steve talked about asking the girls to dance. As a girl, when somebody asked you to dance, it was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm going to step on your toes. I'm the one who's not brave in that situation. So it goes both ways there. But as God calls us to dance, as God calls us to be with him, he did it from the beginning. He did it with so many characters in the Bible. And he did it with the disciples on the night of the Last Supper. And as he sat with them, he took the bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Together we can do mighty things. And after the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. I see you with perfect love and nothing else. And because of what Jesus did, that's the only way I will ever see you. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the amazing sacrifice you have given for us. Thank you for continually stretching out your hand to invite us to dance with you, to partner with you in showing this world love and light with the only love and light that can heal broken hearts, that can mend wounds, and that can save us all. Father, we love you. Our hope, our trust is in you. And I pray today that we each say yes to that invitation. Amen. <clears throat> With this cup, there's two pieces. On the top, you'll find a little piece of bread. So there's two tabs. If you'll open the first tab together with me, we'll take our little piece of bread out. I'll give you just a second. These, truck, these cups are a little tricky, but we can do it together. And together we take this bread knowing that this is the body of Christ, which has been broken for us. And then if you'll pull on the larger tab, very carefully, there's liquid in there, you'll come to the juice. And together, we share in the blood of Christ, which has been shed for us. We'll just take a moment to Think about the ways that God is calling us to be brave. The ways that God is calling you a mighty warrior this morning. A mighty hero. And think about the ways that God is inviting you to dance with him this week. Go with the strength that you have. When God is with us, we have so much more than we need. As we've said several times today, our world is broken and hurting. There is no solution apart from our Lord. That solution rests within us. We will answer the call. Go and do what we can to make this more like the kingdom of God. And now, may Jesus Christ, a risen Lord, 
bless you. May he give you the strength to walk in the place that you are called to be. And most of all, may you know the delight of your Lord when we answer his call. In the name of Jesus, amen. Sometimes on this journey